All right, we're going to get into the second part of the presentation, and that's rehabilitation strategies. So our learning objectives, the things we really want you to know from today, we're going to talk a little bit about the role of the cerebellum in motor control. We already started. We'll just uh, go a little more into a couple things uh, that pertain to rehab. Um, we're going to discuss what's out there in the literature for ataxia rehab and um, discuss some of the motor learning theories related to ataxia. Um, and then we're going to provide some exercise examples. Um, once again, make sure that they're the ones that are right for you by getting some input that's individualizing it to you from your clinicians. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about some alternative exercises, including something I'm particularly fond of, which is Tai Chi. And then uh, talk about how you set your goals for uh, rehab and uh, for mobility in general. And then lastly, what's our role as physical therapists and other rehabilitation providers so that you know who to go to um, for what things that are concerning you. So um, the role of the cerebellum, um, mostly I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, so you all know, but just in case, uh, uh, coordination is uh, one of the main features. So like we talked about reaching tasks um, and controlling um, timing as well as uh, coordinating joints, multiple joint movement. So for motor controls, moving smoothly um, and how fast you can move accurately. And then also this uh, component of it's involved in how we learn a new movement, how we adapt to an environment, and how we learn something new. And so I'm just going to give you like a little overview about how we do a lot of different motor learning tasks. So you can think about things that are step by step, like all those DIY videos on YouTube. You know, we tell, you teach you first how to pick up a spoon, and then how to put a spoon and get something on the, on the spoon, food on it, and then how to, how to put it to your mouth. That's a good way to get through some stepwise learning, but it's not very practical for, you know, every day. You wouldn't want to have to always think, okay, now I'm going to put my right foot forward. Now I'm going to shift my weight to the other foot. That would take a long time. So other things that we learn, by ways we learn is like mass practice. So if you think of a toddler learning to walk, they cover a football field a day. And that's why all of your parents of young children are really tired. And also a good way to get a lot of practice. It requires just repetition. Um, and then uh, there's something called reinforcement. And so, you know, if you get a reward for something that you do right, like when we're kids and we learn how to swing on a swing, you repeat that. The thing that, you know, gets you what you want, you do again and again. And the thing that doesn't work, you stop doing it. So that's another way that we might learn a new motor task. Um, similarly, it might be like riding a bicycle. Um, you, once you kind of get the hang of keeping your balance and pedaling, that, that gives you reinforcement to keep learning. Um, but the last one that I wanted to talk a little bit about is error-based adaptation. And so you might get a good feeling of that now while you're here on this trip. Um, but if you think about if you drive a car and your spouse has a car, it's typically easy for you to switch back and forth between one and the other. And you don't even think about getting in and driving a different car. But when you get to a new location at the airport and you rent a car, the first time you step on that gas pedal or the brake, you stop hard or you go too fast. Um, but it doesn't take you very long to get the hang of doing it. So you're not learning something new. You already know how to drive a car, but you're gauging, you know, how much you need to adjust how you move in order to control this new car. But what you'll recognize as having learned this is when you go home and you get in your car at the airport to drive home, suddenly you also have that jerky fast thing. So it teaches you one that you were able to learn a new, a new motor pattern to drive this other car because you have to now relearn or unlearn that in order to drive your car. And then you can pretty easily go back and switch back and forth. But this is a mechanism that the cerebellum is really important for. And so without it, it really impairs your ability to learn a new task. So we know in kids that the cerebellum is not really fully developed in doing this kind of th activity until about 9 or 10 years of age. Um, uh, but also to relearn something if you are unable to do it now, you don't any longer have this mode of motor learning to depend on. Um, so that's just sort of the introduction to that. Um, sorry. Uh, when it comes to um, treating movement disorders, is, um, it, the type of movement disorder is very important for guiding treatment. And it's important that you go to a neurophysical therapist that is familiar 
with the differences in um, working with cerebellar ataxia versus somebody who has Parkinson's disease. Um, in the case of Parkinson's disease, their movement challenges are different in that the brain's, the basal ganglia de de neurodegeneration is affecting a person's ability to start initiating a movement or taking a step, kind of like thinking of a car of trouble having, getting started or maintaining a speed um, versus um, somebody with ataxia has no trouble getting going. It's just being able to drive straight or drive too fast. Um, so when it comes to treatment in Parkinson's disease, the movement principles are high amplitude, big movement, using external cueing to help jumpstart a dimmed internal go signal and, and balance training um, as balance is one of the cardinal symptoms of Parkinson's. Versus cerebellar ataxia, for the most part, not, not for everybody, but for the most part, we're working on slow and soft movements, quality of movement, not quantity, not big movement, and, and of course, balance training. Um, we're gonna review some evidence in the literature um, in the next few slides. Um, and it's, this is a systematic review. It's difficult for um, you know, big rehab outcome studies to take place, because again, there's the number of people with ataxia is relatively small. But this group um, narrowed down their search to 17 studies and uh, almost 300 patients. And the treatments that were done across these studies included balance and coordinative training, multidisciplinary and patient rehab, cycling, balance training with feedback, treadmill training. And 15 out of the 17 studies revealed significant improvements in at least one outcome measure, um, whether it was ataxia symptoms measured by the SARA or balance or function or gait. So the general conclusion uh, that is that there is consistent evidence that rehab improves function, mobility, ataxia symptoms, and balance in degenic, degenerative ataxias. This is a group from Germany uh, who published a study um, a while ago now. Winifred Ilg and her colleagues, they were very, in, very motivated to prove a point that exercise could be helpful in ataxia. Um, they recruited 16 subjects, 10 with cerebellar ataxia, 10, 6 with sensory ataxia. They had people working out in their lab three days a week for an hour for four weeks, plus an hour day per day at home, 10 hours per week of training total. Who has 10 hours of time to do exercise <laughs> per week? It's, it was a pretty intense program. Um, they did standing dynamic balance exercises, whole body coordination, reactive training. Um, challenging all sensory systems, um, vestibular function, um, somatosensory systems. Um, and the results were that the cerebellar taxi individuals did show improvements in their kinematic measures, walking speed, their variability of steps and body sway became less variable, their quality of movement got better, and their dynamic balance improved to a level of significance after the four weeks of training, and people maintained those improvements. Um, and the, meanwhile, the people with sensory ataxia did not improve um, to a level of significance. They did prove, but not to a level of statistical significance. So, and then I'm gonna, Jen Keller here did a really cool home program study at Kennedy Krieger Institute. My, my fun Zoom functions apparently did not work, so I apologize, but you won't miss any information. Um, so yeah, we did this uh, home balance exercise program with uh, 14 people with um, a tax cerebellar ataxia, um, and they ranged in age, about a mean age of about 50 years, and they had pretty moderate um, ataxia from the ICAR score, which is a neurological score for how severe ataxia may be. Um, and we asked people um, to do balance training, they did three sitting balance exercises and three standing balance exercises. Um, they did it for 20 minutes a day, three to five times a week for six weeks. And we measured them before and after in their walking and their balance um, and their uh, ataxia rating scale. 
Um, one uh, important thing we asked people to do, um, they came one week and we evaluated them. They came back two weeks later and we made a program where we tried to target a range of, of challenge of the exercises so that um, they had to progress them on their own over the course of time. And so we tried to give you an idea of what's really easy and what's really hard and what's right in the middle and to work for that middle range to a little bit more for how difficult it might be to do a balance exercise. And, um, what we found was that um, some people did the exercise not as often as we had uh, hoped, but they really challenged themselves a lot. And other people did the exercises um, a lot during the time, more times than we required, um, but they did not challenge themselves. And um, as Jen talked about, our, this was a little easier of a um, you know regimen, I would say. You could do it in your home and it uh, wasn't as intense as the other program, um, but we also paid you and just think about what reward you can give yourself because in studies of exercise we get lots better success I think because people are really motivated to do it not just by how much the exercise is but that they're getting something else in that background so I think it's just something to keep in mind um, but what we found was that the people um, who challenged themselves more, they were the ones that improved their walking more. And so um, they rated their exercises on this zero to 100% scale, and we're targeting that 50 to 60% range. And you can see there's a, a you know group of people that did that and were able to, and if some people that were not able to meet that level of challenge. And some of, uh, uh, um, well, let me finish, I guess. So they, um, this is a change in walking speed. So to change your walking speed by about 0.1 meters per second has been shown in um, a lot of different populations to be really um, uh, important for your quality of life. So they improved at least that much in their walking speed. Um, and so uh, we thought that was a really important factor. The problem with challenging yourself is that sometimes people can't do that on their own. They don't feel safe or they don't know how. And so that's one of the you know things. It's good to know that we were able to do this in a small group of people, but also that maybe uh, that's a reason for having some support from your caregivers or a therapist to help you um, find out what that best thing is for you. Um, it was nice to know that some sitting exercises were also helpful so that if you know you're having not a good day, you maybe can do some sitting balance exercises when you can't do your standing exercises, or you could base them, spread them throughout your day. Um, it improved a number of walking measures, not just walking speed. So um, it did it improves uh, balance as well, but not significantly um, by statistical significance. Interesting for our group, we had people who also had sensory ataxia as well as cerebellar ataxia. And, um, and those people also improved, so we didn't see the same um, uh, confounder in, in our small group. And then um, we try you know, now to gauge our exercise programs to make sure that they do meet some sort of challenging but safe level of ability. Um, uh, it's good to know that your own home exercise can work to do this and that um, the improvement is related to the actual like treatment um, text uh, intervention that's given um, and that intensity matters but one of our questions is why does this work so you know I told you that people can't learn um, from like this adaptation and that would be a way that we would normally think you might learn a new balance activity would be using that adaptation where you change from one thing to another like one activity we did was on a therapeutic ball or on a balancing disc and that's different than sitting on a regular chair so that might be hard to transfer and um, so a study, some of the studies that have been done in our lab um, kind of, we think, explain this or give us a hint as to why. So one study that was done, we looked at like, how does it matter where you put your foot? Does it, does it matter how you place your foot in one place or another as you're walking? Or does it matter how good or bad your balance is for how well you walk? And what we found was that how uncoordinated you are had much less of an impact on your ability to walk than how imbalanced you were. And so that's one of the reasons why we targeted balance was um, because we thought that that would improve walking the most. Um, and then um, for motor learning, uh, a, 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 a doctoral student, postdoctoral student in our lab, she started looking at this reinforcement learning. So like I talked about learning, you, do, you kind of keep doing a movement that works well for you, like a swinging, um, and then you can improve your walking. And she looked at it in both um, people with and without cerebellar ataxia, and she found that this kind of learning is, is uh, preserved, and so it's available as an option. So that might be one reason why you know people are able to improve from exercise training. Um, 
the thing is, um, it has to be done pretty specifically in order to do it. So if you're really um, sort of, uh, you know, trying everything you possibly can, you know, you're just like reaching all over the place, you're, you don't really attribute it to yourself. So you maybe don't, re re you don't repeat the things that work well. And if you don't explore the area where you're trying to reach very much, you don't change anything as well. And so um, I think we're still fine tuning how we um, make our our interventions in future research to you know harness what's preserved and uh, and still available for learning a new motor pattern with this targeted approach and so that's where some of those like robotic arm studies that um, Bill and I was shown demonstrating in the video are now important as well as some virtual reality to see if we can use these um, feedback loops in order to get better better improvement in movement. Thank you, Jen. Good work. And this is the, uh, uh, just highlighting the importance of aerobic exercise. Um, this was a study done by a group at Columbia University published just a couple years ago um, in 20 individuals with genetic cerebellar degeneration. And they had people doing stationary biking five days a week for four weeks at a level that was intense for that person, at least 30 minutes. And their clinical neurological scores did improve uh, significantly, two points, which again, according to natural history studies, that's the equivalent of one to two years of disease progression. Then they did a follow-up study and they compared the, effic the efficacy of aerobic exercise next to balance training. And they did this during the pandemic, so it was pro pretty much on the person to do these tasks at home. So one group, 19 subjects, did 30 minutes of aerobic stationary biking at their target heart rate five days a week for six months. And then another group, 17 subjects, did 30 minutes of uh, balance training or equivalent of six tasks, five minutes each, five days a week for six months at a level that was challenging to them. It was a pretty much a self-guided program. Um, they had over 70% 70, 70 compliance throughout the protocol, and their results showed improved serototal scores among both groups. The aerobic group improvements were slightly better than the balance group, but when they looked, broke down the Sarah score, balance subscores, the, those actually improved a little bit more in the balance group. So aerobic training is very important. Um, it's not for everybody. You do wanna exercise the point, not to the point of absolute total exhaustion, if you're someone with Friedrich's ataxia, you might be needing to be mindful of um, risks of, you know, related to cardiomyopathy. Again, exercise is good. You just don't want to go to total exhaustion. Um, and in some cases, a certain episodic ataxia, aerobic exercise can be a trigger of symptoms. But for the most part, it's very, very, very important uh, with a lot of benefits. Um, okay, so just to take a little change of direction here. I'm just going to present a little bit of research um, that I did um, looking. At, I'm a vestibular rehabilitation therapist, so I look at, uh, I'm commonly treating people with inner ear balance disorders. If For those of you who are not familiar with the vestibular system, it's kind of your sixth sense. You don't really know about it until it's not working perfectly. It's kind of um, next to your, it's in your inner ear. It's your human gyroscope and it helps you to sense um, where you are, uh, where your head is in space with movement. And it's closely connected with the cerebellum to generate accurate eye movements with head movement to allow you to see clearly. Um, but I became aware of, in, when I'm working with patients in the ataxia clinic, of some people complaining of blurry or bouncy vision with head movement. Um, and I noticed, indeed, some people had ocular motor signs, um, including extraocular eye movements with rapid head movement um, that affected their ability to keep their eyes stable on a fixed target with, with quick head movement. So last year, I did publish a paper looking at the relationships between these ocular motor symptoms, eye head coordination, and activity in ataxia. Here's a figure showing that individuals with ataxia reporting the symptom of blurry or bouncy vision with head movement, the medical word for that is oscillopsia, do have symptoms comparable to those of bilateral or uh, vestibular loss of function in both ears. Um, so this is a, a table of 
representing 19 individuals who filled out a questionnaire that's 43 items asking questions like, can you recognize people's faces as you approach them? Or can you um, read street signs when you're riding in a car? Um, the blue line on the bottom is uh, normal. Um, the, the green line is the value of severity of symptoms in somebody with inner ear or vestibular loss on both sides. And then the red line is the ataxia individuals that I tested, um, which was kind of shocking. Um, and it was interesting that the higher level of symptoms, um, the slower the walking speed. This next figure is showing um, basically eye head coordination or, or the integrity of the vestibular physiology um, of your ability of your eyes to keep focused on a target with rapid head movement and looking at people, uh, healthy controls in the white boxes and the ataxia patients in the gray boxes. If you're turning your head, your, eye is, your head is moving at a certain velocity, your eyes need to move the same velocity opposite direction for you to maintain a stable gaze on what you're looking at and see clearly. If, um, so a normal, perfectly perfect value of, or what we call a vestibular ocular reflex gain would be a value of one a one-to-one -one ratio of eye velocity relative to head velocity. So, um, and then these, these, the, there are six semicircular canals a part of your, semi, of part of your vestibular system. So we were able to measure those um, vestibular responses to passive head rotation in all six canal planes. And indeed, they were impaired in people with um, ataxia. But interestingly, the I had coordination results, so the VOR gain results were not correlated with the severity of symptoms of oscillopsia or blurry or bouncy vision. This group in the Czech Republic, um, they also showed that people with ataxia have reported oscillopsia symptoms. And I think these symptoms go unrec you know, unrecognized sometimes, often in your doctor's visits for your, or even clinical any, you know, we're focusing on your ability to navigate safely and eat um, safely, um, but these other symptoms sometimes get um, not in the top list of, of priorities to look at. So um, it's interesting that um, this can be an issue and it's something uh, we hopefully can address with future research. Um, but anyway, this, this group did show that a person's ability to see with head movement um, was impair that impairment was linked to these um, ocular, um, it was, re was related to the eye head coordination values, um, but more so and, and less related to actual limb coordination. Um, so again, there's not a lot of evidence in the literature of can you improve that with exercise, but, um, and this is just a mechanistic study. It's not a clinical outcome study, but it was a group um, looking at does lack of vestibular input um, affect the ability for you to keep your eyes stable on a target with head movement? And they looked at people with bilateral vestibular loss, cerebellar ataxia, and healthy controls. And they had people having doing a task where they um, had a head weight and they were asked to move their head right and left, keep their eyes stable on a fixed target. Um, and the, those with bilateral loss could not maintain their gaze, but those with ataxia could. It was just shy of the target, but close. Um, so perhaps people with cerebellar ataxia, you know, people with cerebellar ataxia did show the ability to use motor control mechanisms to allow for a stable gaze. Um, and again, future research is needed to really dive into whether we can change that or modify gaze stability with exercise. Um, and as we said before, finding a large group of people to do big, really solid, um, high quality clinical rehab outcome studies, it's tough. Um, but this group in, um, who also did that systematic review, they have published a study protocol that they are intending to implement um, where they're going to be recruiting look, um, individuals with ataxia and implementing a neuro rehab program um, in 80 participants. And they're going to have people doing six weeks of outpatient land and aquatic therapy, followed by a six month home program um, supported with PT sessions. So we'll look forward to those results um, in the future. Um, so 
we often say like whatever exercise you'll do is the best exercise. So whatever gets you out and moving is important. Um, and so there are a lot of ways that you can um, take what you learn in the in physical therapy um, into the world and participate in different other activities to help you maintain your activity or um, you make progress. Um, one of my favorite is Tai Chi. So this uh, Tai Chi health program that was designed by Trisha Yu is um, actually designed for people with many different ability levels. So you can do it sitting, um, you can do it standing and holding onto a chair if that's all you need, or you can even use it with a walker. And you, they have also the progress further into um, doing it without support. Um, it also gives you all the foundations so that if you want to be able to participate in your community, you will be able to go out and participate in Tai Chi activities that are going on with the added benefit that you've learned how to make changes, to modify it so that it works for you. Um, and then uh, it, tai Chi, like yoga, are mind-body exercises. And um, I think those are kind of an important aspect because in a number of the birds of feather group meetings I've been at, you know, ataxia and stress and overly, you know, um, using more muscle activity than you need is, is another component of um, the disease. And so these things uh, address some of those components as well and can add to um, some management of stress and uh, relaxation with movement movement. Um, Pilates is another, uh, you know, more common activity that's now it's good for strengthening and making sure you have good um, body mechanics and core strength. Um, and then um, you can make it fun. Like, I mean, it should be fun. I think Tai Chi is fun, but it's kind of calm. You know, there's a lot of fun, you know, um, out activities out there now. There's lots of VR. Uh, there's plenty of games. So the things that you're interested in, those are, those are the things that should lead you. Um, and uh, there have even been studies with um, some of these, these uh, different alternative exercises. Um, Oh, and I forgot swimming. How could I forget swimming? So swimming is also terrific. You know, the pool can be one, keep you from falling. You don't have to worry about falls. And it can, so it can support you and make movement easier. But you can also be, water can also be resistive and give you resistance and give you an opportunity to move in ways that you maybe can't move on ground. So um, if you like the water, that's a really great alternative. And then this study here on the bottom left, the Xbox Connect study, um, was done by Winifred Ilgagen, the group that did the intensive balance coordinative training. Um, she followed up with looking at the value of using technology to motivate kids diagnosed with ataxia ages 8 to 20, um, thinking that kids are not going to want to do the boring exercises that we give people. Uh, <laughs> people to do on a regular basis. Um, so they, uh, the Xbox Connect um, people can do, um, you know, say we would recommend if you were to do something like this, um, it would be in the safety of a corner, have somebody standing by you. But they picked games that involved whole body coordination, weight shifting, body movements. They did eight weeks of training, and then they um, followed up with similar outcome measures that they did in the study for adults. And it was fun. Um, so the kinematic or quantitative gait measures, they did improve, um, including their gait velocity didn't improve all that much, but, it, but their quality of movement improved. Their lateral sway became less variable. Their step length became less variable. And again, the little stars represent a significant improvement with intervention. And the quantitative or kinematic improvements correlated with improvements in clinical measures. So that, scale, that Sarah scale, that clinical neurological score, they, people's scores improved um, with, this coordinated, with this video game training. This dynamic gait index, it's a walking measure we commonly use in the clinic involving eight tasks, head turns, body turns, stepping over an object, stepping around objects. That improved with intervention. And the people's Overall balance confidence trended towards improvement, even if it wasn't towards what it wasn't a level of significance. So children with degenerative ataxia can improve um, whole body coordination and dynamic balance um, by highly motivational, intensive coordinative training. And the fun part was their game scores improved the more they did the game. Um, the Xbox Connect isn't necessarily made anymore, which is the hard part of studies involving technology because it's always evolving, but this is kind of a neat concept of what is possible. 
So we played some exercise um, examples. We just did them together. So again, here they are again. You all did great. Um, we're just going to review some other ideas. Um, and it's, again, um, these some are in the video that we played. And on the Johns Hopkins Ataxia Center website is the YouTube exercise video you can refer to. Um, in general, you want to do a little something every day before you get out of bed. A little um, just marching in place, pretending you have an egg under your foot and you don't want to crush the egg. Um, you can be um, challenging your balance in a way where you're low to the ground using a half round, round foam roller and not have to worry about falling off. Um, you can, bridges is really are good to do just for general core strength every day. You can do a progression of adding heel raises or a bridge with leg raises. Um, quadruped exercises is shown in the video and here just for some people even getting into this position and maintaining it is a huge challenge. Um, it can work on your balance just being here plus core stability and then progressions of just first lifting one arm at a time alone, seeing if you can do that. And then based on your ability and your response, maybe think about um, raising one leg at a time, no arms, and then eventually combining the two. So it's kind of on you to constantly assess what your ability is and modify the, and progress the task appropriately. When we're prescribing standing balance tasks, always use a corner. We always encourage people to use a corner at home. You got a wall behind you and on either side of you. And as Jen says, you really need to t challenge yourself. So we want you to kind of stretch out of your comfort zone um, and challenge yourself, knowing that working on these balance tasks does have direct impact on your quality of walking. It's really cool that you don't have to work on walking itself because that can be a little unsafe being in an open environment, but being in the safety of a corner and challenging yourself to do these various tasks um, can help meet your walking goals of being you know, safer and having better quality. So you saw the video. So, um, so anyway, when it comes to you know, you're, you, you want to, when it comes to rehab and, and think, thinking for yourself, how can you improve your life? How can you make your life easier? You, yeah, think about what are your, your personal goals. And when you are, if you do seek therapy, which we encourage you to do to get a custom home program that's right for you and that's doable for you, you do want to tell your therapist what your goals are, what activities are most important for you to be able to keep doing and be safe doing, and what do you hope to get out of rehab. And you have to be ready to address those goals. Um, sometimes you can have big, giant expectations of you know walking perfectly without a device, but think first of like breaking down those goals into very basic steps, like being able to stand independently um, and have a conversation at the same time, um, or be able to navigate in your house um, and do body turns without um, falling. Um, so another, an example of a goal is, you know, don't think of you have to have a lofty goal of walking 10,000 steps per day. Just set a goal based on your current ability and then increase um, that goal based on your ability. Um, and it's okay to modify your expectations, especially day to day. Some days you'll be doing better than other days. Um, and give yourself permission to do tasks slightly differently. Don't think you're giving into this disease by doing things with slight modifications in order to do what makes sense and to be safe for you to navigate without falls. I do have to have that mental flexibility to adjust how you've done things um, and do things do so in a way that makes sense. And addressing, of course, your personal and safety concerns and making sure you are set up for success as you try um, challenging yourself. Um, there's, you know, we talked about sometimes it's good to um, keep a journal um, and, and do write down your successes and things that have worked well for you and things that you accomplished um, that you want to take note of, especially on the bad days you can refer back to and reflect on what, what you've done well recently. Um, you can use a step tracker activity to monitor your existing function and, you know, those are built in as the smartphones are very handy. Um, and they, you know, and they track your, your distance or steps walked per day or week or month or year. You do have to keep it on you, so that's where the Apple Watch can be helpful. But again, assess what you're able to do and then set a goal um, based on your current ability. Right, those are all really important things. Um, we also sometimes just think about, I think I sort of mentioned this before, but um, 
like, when is it a good idea to just continue with um, having your home program updated on like a set interval, three, six months a year, but maybe, <coughs> excuse me, when is it important to um, think about, you know, uh, every week or twice a week for a short period of time, so like up to six weeks. So what is your functional goal that you want to achieve? Um, is it, you know, getting out of the chair more easily? Is it walking um, with or without a, a device? Um, maybe what is the thing that's limiting you? Maybe it's it's good to have some, it would be good to have someone look and see, um, are you more imbalanced um, on your light feet or are you having more trouble with where you're placing your feet? Because that can give me an idea as a therapist about what which things to target and if whether or not I can um, improve them. Um, also making sure that the thing that we're trying to address is something that a, that a physical therapist, an occupational therapist, would, which, who would be the best provider to, to tackle those, that um, treatment? And then um, is it changeable or is it something that would be better addressed with a compensatory strategy like an orthosis or a, or a walker or something in order to um, have more improvement faster? Um, there's other things to think about, like if you've changed recently to using a walker or, or using a wheelchair, um, is there some concern that you know, you're not using it now and so you might lose it? And so maybe you need to uh, have a little bout of time where you learn to strengthen your glutes with like the bridging that Jen described or something like that, because when you're sitting more, you are, tend to use your hip extensors, your glute muscles less. That might be something important to keep in mind. Um, I also think it's uh, important to think about, you know, where you are cognitively and emotionally, and is this really a good time for you, or your, your schedule just too busy getting your kids to school and home, and maybe that's not the time, best time to make that intervention. And then who is your provider? Do you have access to someone who is skilled in neuro rehab, or is it maybe your um, only access is like an orthopedic rehab person? Are they willing to learn, and do they have the things necessary to help you? Um, So key takeaways, highlights of what we talked about is balance, anaerobic exercise, plus being active in general is very beneficial. Um, <clears throat> and future research includes efficacy of gaze stabilization or other ocular motor exercises in ind individuals with blurry or bouncy vision or even having difficulty with reading. Um, current neural rehab evidence mostly focuses on motor functions, but yet more studies are also evaluating efficacy of rehab on improving non-motor functions like fatigue and things like that. And um, targeting individuals' available learning mechanisms is important for best outcomes. And future research will be identifying motor learning abilities among ataxia types, adaptation or error-based learning versus reinforcement feedback strategies versus cognition or... Um, so when it comes to making your life easier, you think when you wanna think about what is within your scope that's modifiable or what you can change. And you can break the, that down into three categories. What can you change about yourself in terms of, we talked about a lot of examples of exercises um, to keep you moving. What strategy can you use to be able to navigate in your world safely and prevent falls? Um, giving yourself permission to do things slightly differently or giving yourself permission to not feel like you have to walk and talk. Um, and what can you change about your environment to set your home up for success and prevent falls? Um, so we work in a multidisciplinary team, and uh, we're physical therapists, so we rely, we tend to tell you more about things that we do as PTs, like customize your exercise programs and give you safe mobility strategies um, and recommend device. But the occupational therapists um, could be a very key to your rehab and your progress. They can help you with your activities of daily living, um, other sorts of adaptive equipment, and helping with cognition and executive function, things that really can help you get through your day as well as uh, speech uh, pathologists who will help you with your communication and swallowing function as well as cognition and um, executive function as well. And I know there's a number of P OTs and speech therapists in the uh, audience, so you know, reach out to them and chat with them while you're here too. Um, uh, I think you heard from speech therapy on a virtual talk as well. And then um, 
rehab and uh, neuropsychology, um, the, these are usually more available at more academic centers, but they can be really help you, help you with cognitive and emotional coping strategies, um, as well as uh, genetic counselors. Um, and uh, finally, physiatry, maybe um, some people might not be as uh, aware of them, but they can help a lot with medical management for your bowel and bladder function and in conjunction usually with um, PTOT and speech therapy. So uh, there are physical therapists that are more trained or more frequently practice in neurological diagnosis. Or, so um, the American Physical Therapy Association, the AAPTA, has a website where they have a thing called Find a PT, and you can um, go to that site and... Um, see this page and you can enter your hometown, what city you live in, what uh, type of physical therapist you're looking for, and it will come up with a search of people. These are just people who are members who have put their name in there, so it might be limited, but you might be able to get like a facility in your area too that's available. Um, I think one really promising thing is there's a um, chapter uh, within this chapter of neurology that does degenerative diseases, and I feel like we're growing in number, and so they actually now have a list too for people who treat people with degenerative disease, which would also be a really good option for someone with ataxia because that would, they would have a lot of familiarity with the same symptoms. Um, and then, and then not, all, not all therapists do register for that site, so, um, and you might live in a remote area again with um, <clears throat> having trouble finding a neurotherapist, so you can always ask your neurologist who they, what, what rehab or neurotherapists um, they recommend or send patients to. So in summary, um, key considerations um, is keeping moving is really important. Evidence in literature has shown that exercise and activity in ataxia is beneficial. Um, you do want to implement safe mobility strategies. Think of what makes sense before you move. Um, in the, and the best uh, mobility strategy that we like to tell everyone is just slow down, take your time, break things down into steps. Um, and I, our speech colleagues would say the same about swallowing and speaking. Take your time, slow down. Um, don't feel like you have to rush. Um, use adaptive equipment when necessary. Seeking a neuro-specialized therapist for recommendations is very important for specific to your situation. You do want to communicate to your therapist the activities that are most meaningful to you and what you hope to get out of rehab. Um, set realistic goals and modify those goals and expectations as needed. Set yourself up for success and prevent falls. Um, and most importantly, um, and this is the message from everyone here, um, you're not alone on this journey. Um, thank you, and we'll um, take some questions. Thank you, Jen and Jen. I have some questions for you. We had quite a few that came in online. So um, two are related, and they are, um, can you recommend some exercises for nystagmus? And how does nystagmus fit in? Okay, good question. Um, so, yeah, good. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. So we talked about some central um, ocular motor signs. Um, downbeating nystagmus can be a symptom of ataxia, and that doesn't necessarily change with exercise, but in some, depending on the neurophysiology, some people might respond to a medication like a, a uh, forming a pyridine, which is a potassium channel blocker. So what I was talking about before um, was the case of when you try to move your head and keep your eyes stable on a fixed target. Um, if you have trouble doing that with fast head movement, um, an exercise that we do recommend, but more research needs to back up if it is its efficacy, and we can all try it just sitting here. You hold your thumb out in front of you, and you're gonna move your head back and forth as quickly as you can, as long as your target stays stable and it doesn't become blurry or move. Um, and you would do that for like a minute, and you can do um, horizontal and vertical directions. You can also progress to moving the target. Um, so your head would move one way and your target would move the other way. It's ideal that you're looking at a letter um, or a piece of text so you can better tell if it's in or out of focus. Another exercise is holding two 
targets up, uh, like in front of you, and you uh, have your eyes and head pointing to one target, then you change your eyes to the other, follow with your head. This is kind of an exercise called gaze shifting. So you're looking, then turning, looking, turning. And you could start this in sitting and then progress to standing um, with different various bases of support. Thank you. And some of the questions that came in are, are about vision and improving vision. And so one of the questions is, is, vis is vision therapy recommended? And if so, how does one evaluate a professional for that? There are, um, so other ocular motor symptoms that can come along with ataxia is difficulty with the eyes working together or vergence, and that can affect depth perception. There is um, a field of vision therapists that can help assess for that and provide exercise recommendations. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and would they also be able to provide eye exercises yes. if you were dizzy? Um, so some of the eye exercises and the principles behind what I demonstrated and what you would do to address the ability for the eyes to converge and diverge are a little different. Um, and again, that would be helpful for someone to be evaluated to determine or kind of tease out which are the, ch which, if, you know, what impairments are present and then try to target treatment according to those impairments. Okay. Another question that we have is, can um, balance be improved by strengthening the vestibular system? Is that possible? Well, that is a great question. So by doing these balance exercises, we are thinking that we are upweighting all available sensory information to help you maintain your balance. So these various challenges um, of, you know, um, some, you know, just standing alone can help upweight the somatosensory system. If you're adding head movement, you're challenging your vestibular system and making that system stronger. Um, if you're eliminating vision sometimes or doing exercises with blinks, you're again upweighting other systems to help you orient to where you are in space. So it's good to do a variety of tasks that challenge your all those three major systems, somatosensory, visual, and vestibular systems. Okay, great, thank you. What about salt water aerobics? Uh, well, aerobics in the pool is great. As Jen mentioned, you can kind of exercise in a way that um, you don't have the fear of a consequence of a fall and you have the ability to move in a way that you wouldn't necessarily feel safe doing on land. Um, whether it's a chlorinated pool or a salt pool, I don't think we really know if one is better than another, but just being in the pool in itself is really, really important. Yeah, I know a lot of folks um, back home, they do swimming as an activity and find that extremely beneficial because they don't, takes the balance element out of it, mm -hmm. so yeah. Um, please explain the difference between regular and neuro PT. So or you want to take that one or that's fine. I, I, so uh, I don't know if there is a regular PT. I guess what, um, for physical therapists, I guess uh, we're kind of trained like, um, like your internal medicine physician. We can cover a lot of different, you know, all of, like we, we're movement experts. Um, but what happens is, is uh, typically uh, we end up, you know, focusing on a practice area that we um, spe end up specializing in. And I think our, Typical practices um, focus a lot on orthopedic injuries, so just think about getting an ankle sprain or something like that. So that would be your kind of typical clinic that you might see they do a lot of. They may also do a lot of fall prevention for um, seniors um, and things like that. And then um, at some places, like maybe a big medical center or a hospital probably location where people are being treated for other things like stroke or multiple sclerosis or spinal cord injury, they're gonna have therapists that are more specialized or more frequently see basically people with neurological injury. Um, but any physical therapist is trained um, you know, in a broad spectrum. So if you're in a rural area, probably you're physical therapist is familiar with treating a wide range of diagnoses um, so thank you is your trial program available virtually you mean for the eye the the study where I was it does yeah, I think it's for the study that you're offering yeah that was uh, something that I did during the pandemic um, it was something where I collected data with the an IRB approved 
protocol um, in the clinic and then just took that data during the pandemic and looked at um, all those relationships and kind of just, um, so when, if, if and when we get a study going for um, the efficacy of gay stability exercises in cerebellar taxi, we'll certainly have to find a way to make it a virtual option to um, improve the opportunity for everyone to participate and get a bigger sample size, so. Thank you, and I have one last question, and I'm gonna apologize ahead of time because I'm not sure I'll pronounce this correctly, but the question is, have you worked with patients who have ataxia and retinitis pigmatosa? And if so, have you noticed um, balance complications? Um, I, might, I think I know who might have asked this question because she might have been in our virtual um, support group session last week. Um, you know, it's, yeah, that's a very rare form of ataxia, um, and it's um, something that can affect your, you know, if you have an actual visual acuity impairment, um, that can affect your, of course, your, your available systems to orient you are where you are in space. So someone with that condition would be relying more on vestibular function and somatosensory function, so more reason to keep working on these balance exercises to upweight the other systems that are available in absence of fully functioning visual acuity. Thank you, that's, that's it for all the questions that we have. I wanna thank you both. It was a really informational presentation. We learned a lot. Thank, thank you. you for Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us.